This is Books of Titans, the podcast dedicated to the influences of influencers. The books that have helped shape prominent inventors, business leaders, athletes, intellectuals, scientists, and others. We'll talk about what makes these books such classics and at least attempt to have an intelligent discussion about what makes them so important and influential. Hello, this is Eric Rostad coming to you right outside of Nashville, Tennessee. Today I'm going to cover Endure by Alex Hutchinson, Mind, Body, and the Curiously Elastic Limits of Human Performance. This is book 35 of 52 for my 2019 reading list. This book quotes Samuel Marcora as saying, Endurance is the struggle to continue against a mounting desire to stop. The struggle to continue against a mounting desire to stop. Let me ask you a question. What constitutes that mounting desire to stop? Maybe think back over to your own life, uh, some endurance events that you've done. Maybe it was a, a bike race, uh, a running race, or a swim swim meet of some sort. What kept you from going further? What kept you from enduring longer? Was it a physical limitation or was it a mental limitation? Was it physical in the sense that your muscles cramped, you just you couldn't take that next step? Maybe you were so thirsty that, that you needed to stop or so hungry that you had, had to get something to eat? Or was it a mental limitation? Was it something in your head saying, you can't go on, you can't do this, you can't finish, you can't go as fast as you're going right now? That's basically the question that the author seeks to answer in this book. Is human endurance limited physically or mentally? Alex Hutchinson is the author. He could probably actually become the next Dos Equis most interesting man alive. He's a journalist, having written for startups such as the New York Times, the Globe and Mail, and Runner's World. He's written three books. Endure, this is his latest one from 2018. Uh, before that, he wrote, he wrote, Which Comes First, Cardio or Weights, Fitness Myths, Training Truths, and Other Surprising Discoveries from the Science of Exercise. And then his third book, Big Ideas, 100 Modern Inventions That Have Transformed Our World. So two, book, two books more on the, the physical side of things and then one on uh, modern inventions. Before that, he dabbled in a field called physics. When I say dabbled, I mean he got a PhD from the University of Cambridge. Yes, that's the one where Isaac Newton, Stephen Hawking, Oliver Cromwell went. And then after that, he was a postdoc researcher at the NSA working on quantum computing and nanomechanics, two things I don't even know what they are. He's Canadian and he resides in Toronto. He's also a runner and a very fast one at that. And that, that experience of, of being a runner and, and being in Olympic trials and, and intense races was actually a big part of this book. Endure was published in February of 2018. As for the structure of the book, the foreword is written by Malcolm Gladwell, so that, that's uh, not a bad way to start. Malcolm Gladwell is also a runner, and, and, uh, and, and so he talks about that and, and just kind of introduces the book. It's a, it's a nice foreword. From there, the book is set within the quest to break the two-hour marathon. No one has ever run a marathon in under two hours. And if you're thinking, uh, I've never run the marathon under five hours, yeah, two-hour marathon is insane. That means you're running at four minutes and 35 seconds for 26.1 miles. Uh, you would have to do that to break it. And, and, and so the book is set within that of, of, uh, of kind of a secret plan to, to, to get a group of the top runners to, to break two hours. And then each chapter starts out with sort of an extreme example. Uh, for example, one of the, one of the chapters starts off with, with the story of somebody lifting a car off a person in a life or death situation. And then Alex breaks down that story and goes into a, a little deeper of what actually might be going on and you know maybe somebody didn't pick up a full car but uh but they were able to get enough of the car off of the person uh so it's it's interesting in that sense of of these these intense stories that 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 we'll often hear uh but maybe if we dig in a little bit deeper they can tell us something about endurance or they dispel myths about endurance 
from there, he, he describes different fields of thought in relation to endurance uh, and, and, and goes into different parts. So part one is my, mind and muscle, part two limits, and then part three limit breakers. So physically, the limits that he, he writes about are pain, muscle, oxygen, heat, thirst, and fuel. And then mentally talks a lot about different types of, of mental things, whether they are conscious or unconscious. So that, that's, that was neat too, because it, it's not just the things that you're thinking about in your head while you're running a race, but it's also the unconscious things that you have no idea are happening, but uh, they're tied to what's going on in your body and your brain. And it's really fascinating stuff. As for who suggested the book, that was Alex Gajewski. He is associate producer at ESPN, and he's doing big, important things around the world. But last year, he was podcasting. He was was reading books and then podcasting about them, and I loved that podcast, and I I send him a message every now and then and try to get him (laughs) to go back doing it. But uh, he's very busy with his job at ESPN. If you follow him on Twitter, you'll see him around uh, a lot of famous famous athletes. So uh, it... Props to him, but he Alex actually interviewed Alex. So Alex Gajewski interviewed Alex Hutchinson, the author of this book, on his podcast. And that's how I first heard about this book and was immediately intrigued. And so I added it to my 2019 reading list, read it this year between August 14th and 18th. It's a 267-page book. That's uh, So uh, in four days of reading, that's 67 pages per day. It took me seven hours, 52 minutes, and 18 seconds. Uh, For the fastest marathon times, that would be around four marathons. Uh, The other way I like to look at this is the average American watches three and a half hours of TV per day. So in a little over two days, you could get, instead of watching TV, you could read this entire book. That breaks down to about a minute 46 per page. My initial reaction is I loved the book. I, I think about this physical, mental divide in terms of endurance limitations all the time. I'll get into that later in the episode, why I'm a nerd and think about that all the time. But, uh, but basically, this was the perfect book in regards to that nagging question in my brain. And also, Alex, the author in this book, challenged me to do something that terrifies me. I'll be highlighting that when I talk about my one key takeaway from this book. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm terrified to do what I know is the challenge I need to do. As for who should read this book, runners should read this book. Although in the foreword, Malcolm Gladwell says that this is not a running book. It's not. Uh, And it does get into the weeds. So this is probably not the book you give to a a beginning runner or someone who's just running once every two weeks uh, to try to get them more interested in running or, or running more. There, there's other books for that. This is for the person who has a burning desire, a burning passion to improve their endurance capabilities. It's for the person who wants to get a personal best in their marathon or or their their race of choice. And they want to understand how the the human body works, how the mind works, how those two things interplay with each other to improve. So that could apply to athletes in general. I I found it fascinating. As a runner, I found it fascinating. Coaches should also read this book because it goes into a lot of how coaches can can get past a lot of the mental barriers for, for their athletes. And then... Just in general, this is a great book for those who are interested in how our physiology interacts with our psychology. So why is this important? Why is it important to understand limits, uh, the physical and mental side, in, in relation to endurance? Here's a, here's a quote from page 11. Any task lasting longer than a dozen or so seconds requires decisions whether conscious or unconscious, on how hard to push and when. For me, I turn 40 next year, and I want to qualify for the Boston Marathon. I've, won, I've run one other marathon in my life, and my legs gave out at mile 20. I mean, they completely gave out. My, my muscles just cramped to the point where I could not keep running. So I just kind of hobbled along for, for a couple miles 
and was able to run the the final four miles of of the marathon. But why did my legs cramp? And what was interesting is is a very similar thing happened to Alex when he ran a marathon at that same point, the the twenty mile mark. And I remember in, in the marathon that I ran. Uh, there were people just laying on the ground and, and someone else just kind of like beating their legs with their hand as hard as they could to try to just release the uh, the pain in the in their legs. So that was a physical limitation. I literally could not keep running. So why why did that happen? Did I did I not eat or drink enough? Did I not uh, was I not prepared enough? I is a question I've I've had since that marathon. And in this this book answered a lot of those questions, but then there's also the mental aspect. Uh, here's another example for for the past ten years, I have I've run a lot. I, I, I run uh, probably five times a week now, uh, and I've, I've continued over that 10, 10 years. I've I've continued to run more and more. Um, but during that time, I've I've hovered around an average of seven minutes and forty five seconds per mile. I just kind of, these are just kind of normal runs. I go out and, and uh, I'm, I'm not really doing training per se. It's just more, I'm, I'm going on my morning run and, and my average time is seven minutes and 45 seconds. But last year I went to a men's retreat and I ran with an older gentleman one of the mornings at this retreat and he whipped me. I mean, he just, he destroyed me. He was running so much faster, was not winded. I'm trying to keep up. I'm trying to talk to him as well. I can't even talk because I can't breathe. And I, I was, I, I don't know what it did, but it shifted something in my head to where my average running time this year is seven minutes and four seconds. So let me reiterate that. I ran for 10 years at a pace of seven minutes and 45 seconds. I run with a guy one time and I drop over 40 seconds per mile. I've, I've run almost, I've, I've run over 700 miles this year and my, my average is seven minutes and four seconds. Why? <laughs> Where did that drop come from? Where 10 years, no drop at all, same time, and then all of a sudden, boom, 40 seconds per mile dropped because of one run. That is overcoming a mental limitation. So I've seen the physical limitation. I've seen mental limitations. And I I continually have mental limitations. Every morning when I run, there's something in my head telling me to stop, to slow down, to just take it easy. Just, just, hey, just walk from this point home. Don't, you don't have to run all the way home. That's every morning. That is a mental limitation limitation that that I'm conscious of. So this book goes into how the body and the brain are fundamentally intertwined. And the quest to break the two-hour marathon is such a perfect way to frame this discussion. Alex says in on page 204, the mind frames outer limits on what is possible. And so this kind of secret uh, thing, I mean, it's out in the open now, but they, they were trying to break the two hour marathon. And by they, I say Nike, Nike got together researchers, the, the top marathon runners in the world, the best equipment, everything. And they were trying to create the perfect scenario for these runners to break the two hour mile. And it, it was such that if they did break it, they, it wouldn't have counted because it wasn't on a, a, a real track that they were having people pace uh, at different intervals. So, um, it would even create kind of a wind barrier for these people, these, these guys to be running. And so, but their idea was that the mind frames outer limits on what is possible. So even if it's on this closed track and kind of, uh, unreal circumstances, just the fact that someone broke two hours would, would ripple through the running community and allow others to also break that limitation. The mind frames outer limits on what is possible. I've always said that running is 90% mental and 10% physical. And maybe I exaggerate that a little bit because it's probably more 95% mental and 5% physical. (laughs) Uh, And I I say that jokingly, but especially in my mind, I know that the entire time I'm running, it's more the thoughts going on in my head, slowing me down than it is my physical body. 
And what's interesting in this book is, is Alex highlights uh, uh, the 800 meter run. And there is, when you look at times on the 800 meter run, it's people go all out on that race. An 800 meter run is, is two laps around a standard track. And so people are giving their all the entire race. But anything over 800 meters, you start seeing a a dip and then a resurgence towards the end. So it the it has a the graph has a U shaped a, a U shape for for speed. So they're starting out fast, then they're dipping, and then they're ending fast. Why is that? Why are they not just going as hard as they they can the whole time? Uh, this is elite runners and beginner runners. The, 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 this this dip and then a resurgence at the end. Why does that happen? And there, there's different ideas suggested in this book. Maybe there's an inter- internal regulator. Uh, maybe it's it's uh, the, a body. Uh, our bodies have an internal regulator. Maybe there it's it's our unconscious mind. Maybe it's our conscious mind. But why? And it's a, a great question that that uh, Alex goes about answering. In, the, in this book. On the mental side, Alex also talks about how coaches can, can teach athletes. And he quotes Tim Noakes by saying, you have to teach athletes somewhere in their careers that they can do more than they think they can. I know that was a, a very important lesson when I ran track in high school. Uh, this is something coaches do all the time, but uh, there'll, there'll be a workout. Maybe it's 800s. And in at the beginning of the workout, the coach says, we are going to run four 800s. So twice around the, the track, four of those. And you are going to run as hard as you possibly can on those 800s, four of them. There'll be a little break in between each one, but we're doing four and you're going to run as hard as you can. So as the runner in your mind, you know that you have four and you mentally prepare for that. You run as hard as you can but you know that there's four after four, you're done. When you get done with four, the coach then says, oops, I, I actually, we're going to do one more and you have to run as hard as you can. And everyone moans and, and complains, but they go out and they do it. And here you thought you gave your all on those four, those four uh, 800s. And then you realize you still had something left. And you still have the ability to run. And that does something in the athlete's mind. It helps them know that they can do more than they think they can. And that is the most powerful lesson that a coach can give the runner. Page 261, Alex talks about the fiercest opponent. He says this, These days the terror has mostly, though not entirely, faded. When I line up for a race, I remind myself that my fiercest opponent will be my own brain's well-meaning protective circuitry. So how do you get past that? How do you get past the limitation, whether it's physical or mental? Alex in the book talks a lot about the physical limitations. And, and as an example, he talks about oxygen and how our initial instincts, if, if we are underwater, our initial instinct to take a breath, we don't really need a breath that first time that our body is telling us we need a breath. And in fact, we don't need a breath the second time our body and our mind is screaming at us to get up and take a breath. You probably need to take a breath by the third time that your body is telling you that you need to take a breath. But that is something you can train yourself to do. You can train yourself to not fall for that first attempt to try to breathe or even the second one. And that, that's what allows people to do deep dives and things like that. But you, you, have to, you have to get over that hump. And Alex goes through a lot of the, the physical limitations and, and how they can be manipulated in a way, how thirst can be manipulated, how even swishing Gatorade in your mouth can, can give you the, the same uh, impact running-wise as, as actually drinking the Gatorade or, or another drink. Another, uh, another side on the, on the mental part of it is... Uh, is that I'm going to read from page 214. The idea of adjusting the brain setting evokes a long-standing debate. Who has to work harder, a two-hour and 30-minute marathoner or a three-hour and 30-minute marathoner? One standard answer is that the three-hour and 30-minute marathoner has a harder task because she has to spend an extra hour pushing her limits. 
but I've always thought that a better proxy for who works harder, on average, of course, is cumulative years and volume of training, not finishing time. The process of training expands the capabilities of the muscle and heart, sure, but it also recalibrates the brain's horizons. As we saw in Chapter 5, trained ultra runners have a higher pain tolerance than non-athletes. And even over the course of a single year, the pain tolerance of athletes waxes and wanes with training cycles. In this sense, all training is brain training, even if it doesn't specifically target the brain. That was awesome. Uh, and it brings in this concept that, that are in a lot of the Books of Titans books of daily practice. Daily practice in this sense for endurance, training your brain for pain. I, I always think back to uh, the story David Goggins told where he was out running one morning and this car pulls up next to him and the guy rolls down the window and says, uh, what, what are you training for? And Goggins says, life. I'm training for life. Not for a particular race, I'm training for life. And that's the idea here, the the... The daily routine, the, the, the morning runs, the daily runs or, or uh, weekly runs, that is training your brain for pain. So we can train physically, we can train to overcome a, a lot of the, the physical barriers, and then mentally we can train to go past that, and a lot of that occurs in this area of daily practice. Alex also says there's no magic elixir. I, I know for myself, I go through periods of focusing on a particular thing. Maybe it's my, my diet. Uh, but in all those things, there's not a one thing that is going to make you a better runner or, or, or athlete. It's, it's a whole slew of things. And the key is to experiment. On page 258, he says, The simplest way of acquiring justified true belief about your capabilities is to test them. Whether you've done whatever you've done before you can do again plus a little more i do hope you read this book and and to that end i want to share a few questions that are posed in the book i'm not going to answer them but these are some of the interesting questions posed and then dealt with and dealt with in the sense of alex presenting both sides of the story maybe even three sides of the story to, to give an overall picture of what different people think about these questions and, and how that can impact your training, your, your endurance. So here, here are some really neat questions. Why is death by endurance so rare? Why do we naturally pace ourselves in a race? Why is a person able to give their all in a race and be able to walk around immediately afterwards? If they had truly given their all, shouldn't they be lying on the floor for an extended period of time? Shouldn't the energy they are using to walk around have been used during the race? Why do people die of overhydration during a marathon? Why do more people die of over overhydration than dehydration during a marathon? Can positive self-talk improve running times? What about smiling while you run? I also asked Alex, the author, a few questions. Uh, I, I did that over Twitter today. And uh, here are a, a few of the questions I asked and, and his responses. The first one deals with drinking hot or cold liquids before running. So here's my question. Is it best to drink a cold drink or a hot drink before running in hot, humid weather? That may sound like a absolutely stupid question to you, but here, here's the context, and, and it comes from a, a section of the book. So I quote, notes that uh, may, may help explain the longstanding tradition in some cultures of drinking a hot drink like tea during scorching summer afternoons. By triggering the temperature receptors in your stomach, the hot drink ramps up your sweating response without heating the rest of your body, which has the net effect of cooling you down. So that, that's why I was wondering, because I, I, I sweat like crazy when I run, and, and so I'm looking for any kind of help here in, in not sweating so much when, when I run. So I, I was curious, uh, should I drink cold water before I run or hot coffee? Uh, right now, I drink hot coffee because I, I run early in the morning, and, and I, I just love that little caffeine boost before I go out. But is that the best thing I should be doing? So here's Alex's answer. He says, despite the very interesting research on hot drinks and stom stomach thermal receptors, I would definitely go with cold drinks. The hot drinks only work if your sweating wouldn't otherwise be maxed out. 
And then my second question is, I asked of Alex himself, do you keep a particular diet? Uh, for instance, an all-fat diet and no car- low carb. And he said, I eat a very broad, omnivorous diet. There's nothing I don't eat. If I had to pigeonhole it, it's probably Mediterranean-ish, lots of vegetables, fish, etc. And I was also curious on, on that side. Actually, when I was reading this book, I, I took the whole month of August to do a, a high-fat diet, uh, low to no carbs. And I did it to, to see how it would impact my running. It's kind of that idea I just shared of, of the key to all of this is ex- experimentation, just seeing what works, what doesn't. So it was a good experiment. I don't think it helped my running in any. I, I did lose some weight, so maybe I'm not having to carry as much weight around when I run now. Um, and it's interesting to see how that diet does, what it does to my body. And also Alex went into a, a lot of, of that discussion as well of, of a high all fat diets and, and that sort of thing. So I was curious based on his research if he if he stuck to a particular diet. Uh, but he said he does more of a Mediterranean diet with with eating eating anything, eating everything, but but obviously being being careful with what he eats. Now on to the final segment and my one thing, my one key takeaway from this book. This, this one terrifies me. And this, this, my one key takeaway from this book is one that I want to implement and I want you to keep me accountable as the listener. So feel free to email me, Eric, E-R-I-K at booksoftitans.com. Send me a note on Instagram or, or Twitter and make sure that I do this. But here is my one key takeaway. Go out fast. Here's the context. Alex did a race where he he went out with the top runners of that race. He ran with them, and, and he said in, in his mind, he said, I'm going to run with these top guys as long as I can. And he ended up having a, a fantastic time. And, and he proved things to himself that he would have never known had he gone the traditional method of, of trying to pace himself and... And, and do all those mental games in his head. Instead, he just went out and stayed with the fastest guys as long as he could. And, and I think he stayed with them for, for most of the race. I am terrified to do that. I, I, I think part of it is, is just a, a deep fear of failure. And so going out strong and then having to maybe walk the rest of the race or or run super slowly. I, I, that, that terrifies me in my head. I also used to have dreams and, and maybe they're called nightmares, but, uh, I, uh, this reoccurring dream of, of hearing somebody behind me running towards the end of a race. So I, I always want to be the guy at the end of the race, finishing strong, passing people. I don't ever want to be passed at the end of a race. And I think maybe from track in, in high school, I just have this fear of there being somebody behind me about to catch me and pass me at the end of a race. And so I, just, I know that if I go out strong on a race, towards the end of the race, it's likely that a ton of people are going to be passing me because I've given my all at the beginning of the race. But I need to do it. I need to sign up for a 5K or a 10K around town here and challenge myself to just go out and stay with the top guys and see what happens. I need to mess with my conscious mind because my conscious mind puts limitations on myself. And the times that I get better are like when I run with that guy and, and I see that, hey, I lived, I made it through running with this guy who runs a lot faster than I am. I can do this. And that creating some shift in my head that has allowed me to run faster since that, since that, since that time. What's, what's interesting is, is in this book, Alex highlights how the Kenyans train. He, he, he makes a statement in the book that 95% of, of the top marathon times are from Kenyans and Ethiopians. And on page 248, he says, Kenyans, when they're, they're running, they train by running with the leaders for as long as possible, which is, which is different from what I've always done and, and been trained to do, which is to, to set the right pace. You don't want to go out too strong and, and, and blow it and, and, and that. But 
maybe we should be taking some lessons from these top runners in the world. They're, they're trying to train that way to stay with the leaders for as long as possible so that they can try to prove themselves or, or, you know, maybe, maybe they'll see that they are better than some of the leaders if they, if they stay with them the whole time. But it's an interesting idea. Again, one that terrifies me, but one that that is my key takeaway. I'm going to do it. I'm going to sign up for a five or 10 K and, and stay with the top guys for as long as I can. I also want to, uh, to, to qualify for Boston next year. Uh, I'm going to do the Nashville marathon, but I need to do this first, that 5k or 10k and run all out. To recap, I I love this book. He referenced Shackleton's expeditions. He referenced the two hour marathon. He talked about things I've been thinking about for a long time. I've, I've, I've had questions about this helped to clarify a lot of those questions. It helped to prioritize. Uh, Like I said, I was doing this for the whole month of August. I was doing this, this all fat diet thinking that that would be something that could really help me and and maybe even help in my legs not cramping on the race, uh, in the the marathon. But I was probably giving too much to that and and not not just looking at all different aspects of maybe stretching, eating well, yes, but not that being the one thing. So very helpful book in that sense. And just a delightful one to read. Uh, seeing kind of these crazy things happen at the beginning of the chapter and, and, and putting it into context. Seeing what athletes are doing around the world, how they're trying to train their brain, how they're trying to even trick their brain into thinking they can do more than they, than they can. Uh, just a fascinating book in that sense and one that I think you'd really enjoy. That's going to do it for this episode. Before I sign off, just a reminder, you can share your reading list on the Books of Titans website. Just go to booksoftitans.com forward slash my books. You can also follow Books of Titans on Instagram or Twitter at Books of Titans. And if you haven't already done so, you can subscribe to this podcast and view, listen to all of our past episodes through iTunes, Android Marketplace, or your pocket podcast manager of choice. If you're enjoying the podcast, please make sure to give it a, a five-star rating on iTunes. I'd also love to hear from you. You can email me at eric at booksoftitans.com. That's Eric with a K. I'd love to hear what your thoughts are about this episode or or other episodes. Uh, One of the reasons I started this project was to to talk to others about the books that I'm reading and to have that, that community. I'll be back next week with another book. And until then, keep reading, keep learning, keep listening. I'm out.